Hello, I'm Ann McLean for Concerts from the Library of Congress. This week, we're presenting the renowned Netherlands Chamber Choir, one of the world's great choral ensembles, performing J.S. Bach's Christmas Oratorio. We're pleased to be able to present this magnificent work in its entirety. Peter Dijkstra is the conductor for this beautiful performance of all six of its cantatas recorded in the opulent concert hall of the Franz Liszt Academy in Budapest. I'm very pleased today to be talking with the choir's artistic and managing director, Tito Visser, who's also a brilliant creative force for many of its path-breaking and thought-provoking projects. Thanks for being here, Tito. Thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure. But to start, I wanted to ask you about your long-standing traditions of performing J.S. Bach. I believe that was a special focus even from the beginning, from the late 1930s, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Bach, anyway, in the Dutch tradition is, um, is, uh, is I mean, apart from the fact that uh, according to many of us on this planet, he's uh, the best composer that ever lived. Um, but um, we have a, a long uh, standing tradition of performing the same Matthew Passion in the Netherlands. And uh, several um, ensembles do that, do that in an exceptional way. The whole movement of uh, early music performing uh, and how that developed in the 70s and 80s it's um, uh, not only thanks to people like uh, Harno Kour, uh, but also uh, Dutch um, uh, fellows like uh, like Gustav Leonard and Tom Koopman. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, of course, the practice of performing Bach in that is, is, is highly important. And the Netherlands Chamber Choir has, uh, uh, of course, uh, not only a relationship with the Matthew Passion, the Jones Passion, but also with uh, his incredible six motets, which we've recorded several times. Regarding the Christmas Oratorio, I believe you perform this every year and with a different backing group each time. Um, this one is a wonderful companion for you, the Concerto Cologne, which we've had here at the library several times. Gorgeous, gorgeous playing and singing, and the trumpets and woodwinds are just beautiful. Each of the six cantatas in this work um, tells a part of the Christmas story, each one for one of the feast days within the 12 days of the Christmas season. And uh, I wanted to ask you about the, um, even though these are independent works, scholars talk about the fact, people like Christoph Wolf talk about the fact that they think Bach might have intended them to be performed at one time. What do you think about that? Um, well, they are, of course, um, uh, intended for for performance on one of the major uh, feast days of the Christmas period. Uh, the, the first part describes the birth of Jesus. The, the second one, the Annunciation to the Shepherds. Uh, the third one, the Adoration of the Shepherds. Uh, the fourth is uh, the uh, circumcision and naming of Jesus. Uh, the fifth is the one. So the fourth is already for New Year's Day. Then the yeah. uh, the the fifth is for the first uh, Sunday after New Year. Um, uh, and the sixth, uh, but um, that's uh, of the adoration of the of the of the of the king. So that's the that's for Epiphany. So um, it, it, it is questionable uh, to, to, to say that that would have been, uh, uh, should have been, should be performed uh, as a whole. But um, what I find personally in the experience of, of, of doing just that, which is um, what we're doing every year, all six cantatas, is that it's um, that it's a journey, and it's a journey like uh, like the Matthew Passion uh, is is a journey. It, it, the, the length of it uh, helps you to sort of create, um, you have to meditate basically, and where you um, uh, in the Christmas Oratorio you meditate on something different than in the Matthew Passion. In the Christmas Oratorio, the, it's it's so. This, or it, it's so full of hope, so full of joy. And musically spoken, it feels like 
really like one big work. Um, the, the, the way it starts with the trumpet and it ends with those uh, uh, trumpets, it, 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 it really feels like you're coming home at the sixth uh, uh, cantata. And for, for me, I think, for me personally, that, that's that emotional level. I think it, for me, it's the most important reason actually to perform all six uh, rather than uh, than doing um, uh, doing them separately or doing one, two, three, and six, which you also hear quite often. I should mention here that our viewers can see extensive notes about the Christmas Oratorio online in our digital program booklet and follow the text. So uh, please look at the website, www.loc.gov. Relating to your work with the choir for the last few years um, and the, developing the 150 Psalms project, the wonderful project that you did, another huge international collaboration, I was thinking about some comments you made about sacred music, that it can be a kind of substitute ritual for us today and that we're still looking as a society for rituals. And uh, talk a little bit about that and about your thoughts on making a choir uh, become a social force, a community building activity too. When we did the 150 Psalms, which is 150 Psalms by 150 composers covering a thousand years of choral music, which we performed in 12 concerts, collaborating with three other top choirs. Last time we did it in the Adelaide Arts Festival before that we went to New York, we went to Brussels, and we went to Utrecht, the early music festival. Um, but only the last time I really was able to find the words uh, which I was looking for, what those psalms do to us, and because they're highly contemporary, and I feel that with a lot of um, religious texts that they are actually uh, very contemporary. And uh, the psalms, they are... Um, not God uh, um, talking to mankind uh, and saying you have to do this, you have to do that, like the Ten Commandments. Uh, no, it's 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 like an SMS from uh, from mankind to to God in in all his despair, uh, uh, seeking comfort, um, seeking uh, uh, reasons to believe, to have faith. Uh, in all his joy, um, he talks to God. So it's it's really the the book that that is from 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 us talking to God, and and that's what makes it so human. And I realize that the Psalms are um, they provide something which we need desperately in this highly divided world. It's, it's like a dot on the map of humanity where you can still find each other when you fundamentally disagree. How can we still talk to each other? How can we still find each other um, in a way? And um, the, the beautiful thing of choral music in that sense is, is why using choral music as a tool in that sense, it's, first of all, it's the human body it's, it's my human body that sings. My father, who was an opera singer, who still did concerts, uh, as we both know, uh, at the Library of Congress uh, back in the early 80s, I think. He once said in an interview that, well, when a clarinetist messes up his high notes, he looks disgusted at, at his instrument. Um, what do I look at when I mess up my high notes? It's my buddy, um, and and that's what's so vulnerable about um, about about singing, and that vulnerability um, is transmitted, um, and especially when you sing with people together in a choir, um, there is that sense of strength and at the same time of, of of vulnerability, but as a quality. And I wish that this world would be could be a little bit more vulnerable and dare to be vulnerable and see vulnerability as a quality. And the second thing is, is that choral music really connects. There, there's a tremendous amount of uh, research 
that has been done um, uh, involving uh, choral music. For example, Oxford University 2015, uh, uh, who um, they they researched and found out that choral music ha um, the has an incredible effect, uh, accelerating effect on friendship making uh, more than any other um, uh, activity. Um, it yeah. uh, it um, synchronizes the heartbeat of people when they sing. Imagine. You're singing together, and all of a sudden, you're having the same same heartbeat. That's that's just beautiful. So um, those two qualities are are just such a such a such a present, such a gift, such a such a beautiful thing, um, and they inspire us on a, uh, as Netherlands Chamber Choir on a daily basis to. Uh, to do uh, to do what we do to do our job, and I think you said something like 1.7 million people in the Netherlands are singing in choirs. That's an amazing number, given your population. That's wonderful. And yeah, it's uh, more than it's more than 10 percent, and it's actually more than their. I mean, you know that soccer in 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 the Netherlands is the most popular sport. There are one million um, uh, members of the of the of the Dutch National Soccer Association, but there are one point <laughs> seven million people singing in a choir. So yeah. you can imagine that we are a force in that sense. And uh, in Estonia, for example, the whole fall of the um, uh, of the of the Soviet regime uh, in the Baltic region was established through choral singing, they formed a court of 250,000 people oh my standing together hand in hand and singing, just praying for uh, and singing for liberty and singing for freedom of speech. And it happened. It, that's the amazing thing uh, of singing prayer. Yeah. Yeah. You've conceived the ideas for many of the compelling projects that the choir has done in the past few years, and our audience will have the chance later this season to experience one of these when we broadcast your performance of Orlando de Lasso's Lagrime de San Pietro. This is uh, a piece at the pinnacle of Renaissance polyphonic composition. It's a monument for the choral literature from 1594, the last year of the composer's life, conceived for seven voices and set to poems by Luigi Tanzillo. It's a somber tapestry of 20 madrigals laden with numerical symbolism and ending with a motet. Um, the 21 parts of the cycle describe the moment of Peter's portrayal the moment of Peter's betrayal of Christ, denying him three times before the rooster crowed. And I'm sure that your your singers have performed this work in the past, but you had the idea to put it with a dancer, to introduce a dancer. And there's a remarkable dancer, Martin Rodermaker. How did you come to this idea? Well, um, it, it started with the with uh, with a moment of huge despair actually because um we were having a yet another zoom call uh about the the corona measurement and the fact that we um there was it was unclear um as to what distance we have to take um amongst each other as singers mm. um in order to be able to stand on stage um and uh we had the sort of general one and a half meter which we use in in the netherlands uh, and in europe um but then uh, the, all of a sudden a uh, german insurance company started to say no but in order for 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 us to insure you you need to be at least at three meters and then uh, another company was saying no eight meters oh my God. and then at a certain point i was so i was crying out in despair, said, well, let's all put them into glass tubes. <laughs> and um, and then all of a sudden, that was a, like a small epiphany, because then I thought, well, what would happen if we would actually do that? Because then you create a sort of, yeah, museum 
pieces, you objectify the singer in a way when you put them in a column. It's stunning to see them in these tall. How did you even build the cylinders? How did you create them? Well, they're not made from glass. They're made from uh, from plexiglass. So you can can if you heat them up, you can actually bend them. Uh, and they're open from the back, actually, although you don't see that uh, very clearly. So you, we they could step in. First, we had the idea really to to lift them so they would stand, and then we would put them over them. But in um, uh, it, for for um, comfort reasons, comfort uh, comfort reasons, we decided not to do that. Um, it's it's already exceptionally difficult for a singer to stand in a tube like that and sing because you get the sound back immediately in your face. They can only hear each other through earphones. Um, 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 so it really was a challenge for the singers to, uh, to do this. The, the, of course, then standing in these tubes as singers, it, it also relates to sort of it gives the idea, it gives the sense of of the idea of, of a choir being being uh, after Corona being sort of a, a, a phenomenon of of past times. We cannot sing together anymore. We all know the stories of a, of of Corona COVID outbreaks in choirs. So there was this sort of fear of. Um, of having us uh, inviting us for for concerts even so um and then to have actually the main figure saint peter as a dancer uh in freedom that immediately uh, imposes the question uh who is actually more free the person who is can enjoy his freedom on his own, but is on his own, or those who share their imprisonment together, they have a um, an, uh, shared experience in that sense. They share their imprisonment, and um, uh, that's how this the, the this concept came about and and slowly shaped. Then I invited the choreographer Nanina Linning to to think of a of a dancer, and we and she. Uh, contacted uh, Marijn Rademaker, who was the former national, uh, the, uh, the former soloist of the National Ballet of the Netherlands, an amazing dancer. Yes. And then, of course, this um, yeah, we we combined the the story of 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 Peter, as you said already. It's it's he. I mean, he was the most loyal companion of Jesus and what this story shows us is that he um, he was so loyal that you would almost think well could you not be Jesus and this story shows us that we are and Peter with us still was human um, he was not perfect he he was absolutely a hundred percent sure that he would always be true to Jesus and then all of a sudden he denies him not once not twice but three times in a very short period and he is devastated about that devastated about this he's he's so disappointed in himself in a way and this journey of 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 um of the lagrime de san pietro is a journey of um reconciliation uh, uh of of it's like the the mourning process like the mourning of of when you lose somebody close to you uh, um when somebody close to you dies you first go through uh, denial then you go through anger and eventually you're able to give it a place so it starts off these these 21 madrigals with the first seven madrigals are really about that pain, that suffering, like, oh my God, I, I can't believe I did this. And Orlando Di Lasso describes the gaze of Jesus, um, looking at Jesus in disappointment, in anger, but also 
acceptance. With this sort of yeah, acceptance exactly. And um, so we have all singers. Um, the, the, they're in the tubes. There are lights, and they go on and off. And every singer, in a, at another moment, looks at Peter like they're transmitting the look of Jesus uh, to to um, to him. And then in the second movement, it's more this anger that plays a role. We see a lot of dancing there as well. And then in the third part, um, um, there is this acceptance, you could say. And I've created this acceptance by um, him, by referring in the dancing to the 14 stages uh, of the cross. Yeah. Um, uh, so every there are seven columns in, with seven singers, and at every column he creates together with the singer, the dancer creates together with the singer a tableau that refers to one of those stages of the cross. So you see him meeting, you see Peter meeting with his mother, you see him falling three times because of the weight of the cross, you see Simon helping him carrying his cross. Um, you see one of the women wiping his face. But it's like a ritual, in a sense, for for Peter to accept. It's a homage to Christ in a way as well. It's such as the these tubes are such a startling, hauntingly relic hauntingly relevant device for loneliness and isolation and that incredibly so during the pandemic and this is for me what came across was that it is a work that heightens our search for transcendence especially during the pandemic and the dramatic revelations of the performance both in the superb singing and superb dancing are very very powerful and i was thinking about your role in this because you are a singer you have been a singer and now you are a director you may not have thought of yourself in the past as becoming a director but you have really made this possible this work possible and others too and i wanted to ask you about um the work that you and I have talked a little bit about in emails about forgotten, forgotten, the the work that you've created with the choir about dementia, this is uh, hugely significant today and especially in the Netherlands but worldwide, and um, for you I know it's a very personal thing as well. But how did you come to the idea of making a music theater piece about this? Yes, my, my father, who was an opera singer, as I said before, um, died of dementia seven and a half years ago now. And um, I was one of many people in this world who are caregivers uh, for their close relatives uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation of, of, um, of somebody suffering of, uh, from dementia. Um, and um, that uh, everybody who has experienced that knows that uh, that's an incredibly tough journey. Um, it's the the demasque of, of of humanity in a way. Um, it it it's it's um, it's um, dementia is a horrible disease, uh, and it and it appears in so many forms. I mean, there's not only the element of forgetfulness. There's also this this uh, element of hallucinations in my in my father's case he didn't suffer from alzheimer where forgetting is the is the main element but um he suffered from louis body dementia where you have hallucinations you have this strong paranoia which you often also see by with with alzheimer and for an artist of course it's um it's a very logical step actually to make a piece of art uh, about it, and that's uh, how we came about the um, the idea of making a musical journey through the mind of somebody with dementia. 
And music has this amazing capacity of changing the atmosphere within a split second. I mean, I can put on some music and you will immediately have a sensation, an emotional sensation caused by that music. And that's what we try to do within this performance. So it's a mix of theater and, and, uh, and choral music. The theater talks about uh, is actually a house doctor who discovers the first symptoms of dementia with himself and it's yeah it's, it's a very touching uh performance it's 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 moving but what is maybe even more moving um is uh yeah what you get back from the audience afterwards it's um there's so many many people who then want to share their own personal story, who see um, a lot of it, what they experience themselves back in the performance, and they find comfort uh, in it. This is a it is an extraordinary work um, with and the music is so varied. Uh, the Brahms motet that is set to the text from the Book of Job, and then uh, Sariaho and um fantasy others and i wanted to mention the recorder music with the electronics quite a range of music and then also the text can you say something about the development of the text with spinvis yeah spinvis is not known in the united states but he's one of our finest singer songwriters he has this amazing ability to to uh, to touch upon the uh, unbearable lightness of being. Uh, he has very uh, the, um, simple texts in a way, um, but with such a big world behind them. It's such a courageous work, and it the, the work conveys a dreadful experience of seeing the destruction of the personality and even the ability to perceive oneself in someone that you love. Um, I saw this phrase in some of the descriptions of your work online, where the mind ends and the universe begins. And I wanted to mention um, on a personal note, when I met your father, when he performed at the Library of Congress, he was, as you say, a tremendous personality, very funny. Uh, the reviews of that concert were that he was brilliant. I'll send you the review and, and uh, described his program concepts as wonderful and imaginative with, and he chose to present with the pianist, Robert Nosfeld chose to present a politically sharp piece by Ton Brunel about war and the tensions of the political strife, not in any one country, but within the world, very much relevant to what you are doing today. Um, and uh, past and present, the concepts of struggle and human human despair. But um, the 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 things that I I think I wanted to say up to you are to thank you for your exploration of these subjects and these these new explorations that go beyond what we are expecting from choral music concerts. And I was reading a comment somewhere about how we know about the migration of the spiritual experience from the cathedral to the concert hall, and that we now can purchase a ticket to have a spiritual experience, what we call a, a spiritual experience. Um, this is in, a, in an increasingly secular world this is uh it's remarkable and and deeply touching and affecting that we are able to do this so um i wanted to 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 ask you what are some of your new thinking paths as you look forward thank god we are moving away from the pandemic you've been so creative and thinking of things that will help everyone understand this experience and get Get, survive it. What kinds of thoughts are you having now? It's it's a tough tough world that we are still looking at. Yes, and uh, 
one of our new projects is um, which is going to be launched in 2024 is uh, is called Cities, um, and it's uh, actually connecting the old Lamentations, the, the the fall and rise of Jerusalem, is also the fall and rise of every city in this world, and um, <clears throat> those text of the Lamentations are incredible and the music um, that has been set to this text uh, by so many amazing composers over the past 600 years is, is also amazing and we would like to perform them but at the same time we realize that we have a new diaspora we have um, people who do not relate to those uh, deeply Christian texts in that sense, do relate to the subject of the fall and the rise of a city. And can we build hope um, uh, in, in those cities where so much suffering is going on? And that's what this project is going to be, a, be about. We're going to give a voice to those um, uh, people from the New Diaspora and young slam poets, um, the the the... the the young unknown Amanda Gormans of this world, um, and um, and ask them to to reflect on the uh, fall and rise of their city, and um, then we're going to ask composers to put this to music, and create a new canon of music which is um, uh, not Christian uh, but resonates to um, a lot more. Uh, people, also those who are not from a Christian background, but who all also, of course, play such a substantial role in this Western Christian society. I'm glad to end on this note of hope, because I think the Netherlands Chamber Choir does embody this in your programming, uh, your artistic vision. And I... I wanted to say my thanks to you for being a spiritual force, perhaps even an evangelical one, certainly an ecumenical one. And we are grateful to be able to share these programs with our audiences at the Library of Congress. Thank you very much, Tito. Thank you so much, Anne. It's a pleasure to, um, to uh, have been able to have this conversation with you.